Hello, my name is Dan Merrick, Director of Plant-Based Culinary and Development for Ruby, and I'll be your instructor today. I have a background in plant-based cooking and have worked in that field for the past 15 years for companies like Whole Foods Market, nonprofits like Whole Kids Foundation, many culinary schools. I run a vegan catering company and currently sit on the board for Slow Food. Today, we're going to do an Ask the Chef event where you can ask me anything cooking related and I'll answer to the best of my knowledge. Before we start our event, a couple of housekeeping items. On the right-hand top of your page, you'll see a dialog box that says, add question here. If you're inspired to ask a question or make a comment, type it in and it makes its way to the queue to see on the right-hand side of the page. You'll also upvote questions by hitting the heart-shaped icon in the individual questions, and we'll answer those with more votes a little bit sooner. So let's get started. I'll start answering your questions now. All right, so our first one comes from Candice. Hi, Candice, thanks for joining us today. Um, our question is, when, when committing to a plant-based diet, what would you say is the most difficult attribute to converting from a diet containing meat to one with zero meat? Well, it's been quite a long time since I've done that. I've been plant-based for about 23 years, um, but there were definitely some things that I recommend for people quite often to be able to do it. Um, the first thing is kind of take it in chunks a little bit. So when I did it myself, I cut out red meat to begin with, and then I cut out uh, white meats and then fish, and then started focusing on the littler pieces, um, things like uh, gelatin, or if you uh, you know start to really pay attention to ingredients on different things like um, uh, like honeys and uh, you know different kinds of sugars. So um, you know that's probably the best thing that I would recommend is taking it a little bit at a time to be able to move forward. Because uh, if you actually just completely go cold turkey and switch right away, uh, the success rate might be a little bit lower. So um, you know it's okay to be able to do it all at once. But uh, the way I did it personally was I took it in steps and um, did it over, it was probably about a two month period where I did that. Um, and it kind of helped me to be able to figure out alternatives um, in the plant-based world uh, that were looking for same like flavor profiles um, and same textures as well. So that would probably be my best uh, recommendation is to try to take it uh, one step at a time. Um, a lot of people do like doing meat alternatives as well too. So. Uh, that's not always the best whole food plant-based way to go, but, um, you know, looking at foods that have uh, replacements and textures. So, um, you know, like something that comes to mind right away is like a Beyond Meat burger. So something like that might not be the healthiest option for you, but, um, you know, if you wane yourself off of those as well, too, uh, that's a, a good way to be able to convert, basically. So you're still getting that same kind of flavor profile, but you're not eating the meat directly. They also make all kinds of like chicken products and stuff like that that are actually uh, vegan as well. Um, and I do know a lot of people that use those to be able to um, kind of take the leap to be able to convert a lot quicker. Um, just remember that a lot of those items are very heavily processed. So if you're looking to do it for health, you might want to look at some other whole food plant-based ways to be able to make that happen. So thanks, Candice, for that. Marion, so thanks for joining us. While browsing at kitchen stores, I often wonder how many items Chef actually use. It's very true. Aside from primary knives, pots, pans, what are the two or three kitchen tools or appliances you use most? For me, it would be the thermometer in my Dutch oven. Okay, well, that's, those are great tools to be able to use. I would say hands down, I mean, uh, of course your knives, your pots and your pans, but I mean, hands down, the things that I use the most are a food processor and blender. Now you don't necessarily have to have both of those things. Um, sometimes they can take the place of each other depending on how powerful it is. Um, I, uh, you know, do like a high speed blender, something like a Vitamix. Uh, there are a couple other options that are out there as well too. Um, but, you know, I had, you know, in the plant-based world through catering, um, I can't tell you how many blenders I went through before getting a high speed, like a high powered one, um, just because the lower powered blenders would, you know, things like doing like uh, nut milks or, 
you know, cashew cheeses or things like that. The cashews would just uh, burn up the, the motor on it. So a high-speed blender was definitely one of the top things um, on my list. So a high-speed blender um, and a good food processor. Uh, the food processor doesn't have to be an expensive one. You can get one for like $30 um, or even a little bit cheaper. Um, but those are probably the top two tools that I would probably say I use most um, beyond just knives, pots, and pans. Um, other things that I use a lot are like mason or ball jars too. Uh, I do some fermenting um, using those kinds of things. So those are always good things to be able to have in my kitchen. So um, probably those three items if you're asking for three. But good question, Marion. Um, it's really easy to fill up your kitchen with a lot of gadgets and you don't really need a whole lot. Um, you know, think like if you're going camping, like what would you need to bring with you, right? You're not going to bring your blender or your food processor, probably. But uh, if you're just cooking, you know, in an environment where you don't have all those tools, uh, you can really pare it down. So um, small kitchen, just don't have a lot of appliances and stuff to them. All right. So Leanne, hi, Chef Dan. I read that white sugar is okay for vegans while others reject it, but seek, uh, but still seek a sweet treat. I'm trying to reformulate our cookies and bake treats to be vegan and stuck at the sweetener stage to find organic sweeteners in bulk. That's actually an interesting thing. So I'd actually just mentioned that a second ago where, um, you know, you do kind of have to pay attention to those uh, where you're getting your sugar from. Uh, typically, most organic uh, sugars, um, you know, are uh, meat free, if you will. So what we're actually talking about is bone. Um, what a lot of sugar companies do will actually take the bone char from animals that have been slaughtered for their meat. Um, and then they actually use it uh, as like a refining process to be able to make um, like make the sugar white basically. Um, and not everybody does that, but it, a lot of companies do, um, you know, so if you're looking for something like, like uh, what are some of those other ones that are like sugar in the raw, you know, keeps it that way. I think Bob's Red Mill does the same thing as well too, uh, as far as bone char filter, uh, they don't use bone char. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for uh, it in bulk, it really depends on where you're shopping, you know? So uh, a lot of the brands that I typically buy, you know, are gonna be sugar in the raw, Bob's Red Mill. Um, I think Wholesome is one of the other ones that's a vegan sugar as well too. Uh, Imperial does do a one. You just have to make sure you look for the, uh, the pure cane sugar on those as well too. Um, but typically if you just do a little bit of research on the sugars, you can find those pretty quick. Um, and those, you know, vegan sugars are pretty easy to find at most grocery stores. As far as bulk goes, it's a little hard to determine, um, just because they typically won't put like a brand name or something on that. And they typically don't in, you know, put on the ingredient label that they're putting bone char in it because they're actually filtering that out as well too. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. And as far as vegan sugars, um, it's just doing a little bit of research on those, but those brands I think are probably the best way to be able to kind of look where you're going. And then you can still make all those cookies and baked treats um, really easily as well. All right, uh, next one is from Dan. Hi, Dan. Hello and thanks. I'm a physician's committee instructor and would like to improve my whole food plant-based cooking school skills once finished with the Forks Over Knives class so I can help others learn, but I have neither desire nor intention to cook as a pro. Suggestions for continuing. Actually, that's that's totally fine. Um, most of the people that take our Forks Over Knives class uh, are actually home cooks. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it's totally okay. The Forks Over Knives class is a great kind of uh, introductory to, um, you know, the plant-based world of cooking. Uh, if you are interested in the plant-based pro class, that doesn't mean you have to be a professional. About, you know, half the people that take that class are home cooks as well. It just goes a little deeper into the instruction and learning that you would actually get. So, um, you know, we'll cover things like fermentation and other kind of deeper dives into things like making your own pasta. Um, you know, so there are all that would probably be a great way to be able to do if you're graduating for forks over knives going for the plant-based pro is a wonderful way to be able to extend your knowledge base for that um and all those things are things you can do at home it's actually a longer class too it has a lot more information into it beyond that um if you're not looking to just do a class so just suggestions for continuing um you know one of my favorite things is to 
uh, pick up cookbooks and kind of use those for inspiration because what you're learning in the Forks Over Knives course is kind of a base, right? So um, you're getting a lot of different recipes to be able to kind of spark the uh, spark something in you to be able to make these recipes, but make them your own. Uh, most people, especially home cooks, aren't making the recipe the exact same way every single time. Um, so that can actually uh, develop over time and you can start switching up the recipes to be able to really meet your flavor profiles that you like to do. So um, I think that, you know, getting just different cookbooks or if, you, if you're really into forks over knives, they have a great magazine that comes out, I think, four times a year. Um, and they have wonderful recipes on those. I think the holiday one just came out actually. Um, so that would actually be a great place for inspiration um, for continuing your education as well. Uh, but definitely take a look at the uh, plant-based pro class. Uh, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful tool to really start, um, you know, elevating your skills uh, to a bigger level. And you don't have to be a professional to do it at all. There's no, um, you know, it's not based on an industrial kitchen. So you can do those things at home as well, too. I hope that helped, Dan. So Titania, hello, Dan. What exactly is vegan butter in recipes? And can it be replaced with oil um, if I'm in a country where it does not exist? Uh, if yes, which oil will work? And do I need the same quantity as vegan butter? Well, that's a little bit of a slippery question there, no pun intended. Um, you, you typically can't use uh, exact oil amount in vegan butter recipes to transpose those two. Um, but uh, let's start with the top of that. Was um, the, the What is vegan butter? Typically vegan butter, it, are oil-based products. They're typically whipped. Um, you know, uh, they'll put like an acid or something in it to make it coagulate, just the same way they would make a normal butter. Um, you know, so you can make uh, a plant-based butter um, if you want. And, uh, you know, typically what would basically be like, uh, let's see, well, you basically start out with something like a coconut oil. Um, and having something like a coconut oil and then do a plant-based milk and you want that acid like the vinegar, um, typically I would use an, uh, a lemon or uh, a vinegar as well. A little bit of nutritional yeast, turmeric, just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit for color um, and just a little bit of salt. And then you basically kind of melt it all, uh, let the apple cider, cider vinegar into the plant milk, stir the milk until it becomes a butter milk basically. Um, and then toss in the rest of the ingredients uh, and puree until super duper smooth. And then once those are really smooth, you refrigerate it and it can basically be uh, turned into a butter. Um, so I did just put a link uh, to Patrick who is graciously behind the, the camera here uh, running these. And we'll try to, try to put a link up to a recipe for something like that as well too. So that's the first part of the question is what is vegan butter? And that's a way to be able to help uh, replace that. Um, now, other oils, um, you can replace them with uh, oils as well. Um, typically, most oils will work. Coconut oil is definitely one of those kinds of favorites. Um, you can also, uh, you know, like a canola oil is some what people would use, but uh, it depends on the recipe you're doing, you know? So if you're sauteing in a pan, just any kind of an oil would be fine. If you're baking in something that's a high temperature, you wanna make sure to use a high heat oil. But if you're baking, there's actually a whole lot of other varieties of things that you can do as your replacers. Actually, applesauce is a really good replacer as well. Um, you can do, um, you know, like, yeah, I'd probably stay with the the apple sauces and those those things as well. Um, coincidentally, Fran, who runs our um, our vegan pastry course, is uh, a huge knowledge base on this as well too, um, and she might be a good uh, resource depending on what you're looking at. Because what you'll find is each one of the th options that I'm talking about are definitely going to have some playing room. You know, they're not going to be equaled out where you know, a tablespoon of coconut oil is equal to a tablespoon of vegan butter. So you'll you have to wiggle around with the recipe a little bit to be able to make sure that you get it exactly the way you're looking for. So depending on the recipe, uh, really depends on what you're looking to be able to use as your replacer instead. Thanks, Patrick, for putting that substitute up there. Um, all right. From Suo, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Is there a course or a book that you would recommend for professional food plating and presentation? Actually, yeah, there is, um, you know, there are a couple different books that are out there. One of them, uh, it's called A Story of a Plate. 
Um, I can't remember who wrote the book, but it's actually quite a great book and it's good for professionals or home cooks alike. Um, you know, it's, it's a really, uh, it just basically kind of guides you through, um, you know, formal plating, but also really looks at some creative plating as well. There's also, um, you know, a book called the food stylists handbook. So if you're doing like blogs or Instagram and stuff like that, that might be a really good one for you as well too, because that'll actually walk you through um, some techniques that you might not normally see on just regular plating. Um, now just on, you know, your, your plating techniques, we do have some courses that have some of those things into them too, but those two books really help dive in really, um, really well on those two subjects as well too. So that would probably be the one that I would recommend. Um, let's see. And from Mary Lou, in my forks over knives course, it was suggested that a lid not be used to cook vegetables. Pardon me. Uh, not to, or to cook green vegetables as an acid is formed, which discolors the veggie. Does this mean that steaming leafy greens is not the best way to cook them? Thanks for your help. Oh, actually, not at all. I would, uh, you know, steaming green vegetables is a wonderful way to eat them. In fact, uh, any way that you're eating your greens is great. Now, you're right on that from the Forks Over Knives course. It'll show you that um, if you put a lid on those, it will actually start to discolor some of those as well, too. Um, but steaming, you know, those green vegetables, totally fine. Um, you're, you're not, you know, dissipating that out into the water or anything like that. So, um, it, and as far as the best way to cook a green, um, there isn't one, you know, so any way that you're actually eating them, great. The more greens you can get into your body, the better. Um, so, you know, as far as steaming wise, uh, that's a great technique to be able to use. And, um, you know, just again, kind of watch out for the lid uh, on those, as mentioned in Forks Over Knives. So Angela, hi Chef Dan, what is the best water to use for recipes? Purified spring or doesn't even matter? Uh, tap water can be, yeah, very considerably from place to place with that effect, taste, meal outcome. Thank you. Appreciate your expertise. Uh, that's an interesting question. And you were right. Um, you know, tap water varies very considerably from place to place. Um, I typically don't cook with tap water. I'll use a purified water. Um, you know, spring water is great if you have access to it. Uh, but uh, what I do in my own personal kitchen is um, we just have a filtration system. Uh, it's actually a double filtration where there's one for the whole house and then one specifically in the kitchen for cooking. Um, and that's the one I use for everything cooking related. So even like boiling pasta, I'll use that water in that as well too. Because um, as you mentioned, tap water um, you know, is very different. And in Austin, Texas, our tap water is pretty good. But I've been in other places where it's just you can taste it, definitely. Um, that will happen a lot with well water as well too. So if you're using well water and you're not using a filtration system, sometimes you can taste iron out of the, the, the dish as well too. So a purified water is definitely the best way to go if it's an option to you. Um, spring water is wonderful. A lot of people talk about the nutrients that are in spring water as well. In fact, the purification system that I have actually adds nutrients back to the water after it's been purified. Um, but what you're looking for is just a clean tasting water. If you're drinking the water and you're not tasting anything, perfect. That's, that's really uh, what you're looking for is non-flavoring in, in the water. Um, so thanks for the question, Angela. Lewis. Hi, Chef Dan. My name is Lewis Rodriguez, and I've been doing plant-based cooking for almost five years now. I wanted to ask, is there a book to review every three to five years once sharp, uh, just to sharpen the saw in plant-based cooking? Wow, um, that's a great question. And I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I go back to cookbooks all the time. Um, I keep a lot of them around, and I kind of use them as like I don't want to say bedtime stories, but that is kind of what I do. I'll use them just to kind of wind down at the end of the day and go through them and look for inspiration for different kinds of recipes. There isn't typically one that I go back to all the time. Um, I used to say that one of my favorites was the Vegetarian Flavor Bible. Um, there's also a regular Flavor Bible, too. Um, you know, that's definitely high on my list of uh, books that I always recommend to people because what that book does is it's not full of recipes. It helps pair flavors, right? So um, it's a great resource to be able to have when you have ingredients and you're like, well, what should I do with these? How do I put them together? Um, and that's just a good way to be able to, um, uh, yeah, kind of help pair things off as well. So 
Uh, that's probably the one that I go back to the most, or at least had in the past. Um, but other books, uh, as far as reference goes, you know, a lot of them are just kind of technique books and things from, um, you know, even before I was born, just to be able to see some of the history of cooking um, that might not be plant-based. Uh, I love to be able to use techniques that, um, you know, are typically used in, uh, you know, a regular kitchen that has meat in it um, and use those techniques in a plant-based fashion and really kind of look at a way I can use those techniques um, to uh, refashion something in the plant-based world. So, um, you know, even things like La Technique from Jacques Pepin or something like that would be a great book to be able to go through to see some techniques. Now, of course, that book is just full of all kinds of uh, meat processing and stuff, and I just don't go through those ones because it doesn't uh, adhere to the what I'm learning in that same way. So I don't have a specific book, but, uh, you know, generally technique books are always kind of the ones I love to be able to look through. Um, and then the Flavor Bible would be a good one just for helping to pair, especially if you come across a new ingredient you've never used before. But great question, Lewis. All right, so Fritzy, uh, what cookware do you recommend for sauteing vegetables? Um, saute pan comes to mind first, but I think what you're asking is what brand. And I typically don't have a brand that I use. I used to be like, it has to be all clad, you know, like a stainless steel pan or, um, but I kind of fell out of that because, um, you know, as much as I like the stainless steel all clads, uh, they still you know, if it's just a plain pan like that, it's great. You buy it and you never have to buy another one again. Um, but sometimes I'll actually use, um, you know, if I'm sauteing, I'll use a non-stick pan. And I found that non-stick pans, no matter how expensive or fancy they are, they will still chip. And if you chip a saute pan that's non-stick, you typically don't want to use it anymore because then they're starting to degrade and the chemicals are coming off of it as well. So typically what I do is I go to a restaurant supply store and buy a saute pan from them. And um, as soon as it starts to chip or degrade, then I recycle it, get rid of it, um, and then uh, buy a new one. So I typically don't buy expensive pans in that way. Um, my base is definitely, you know, like a higher end uh, stainless steel, um, you know, because uh, it just doesn't give off any chemicals or anything like that. A lot of people don't like using aluminum pans because you actually get some off um, chemicals that come from it over time. But so that's typically why I go with a stainless steel. Copper pots are great too, but they're quite expensive um, and you have to polish them all the time. So a stainless steel uh, pan is great for kind of every day, but if you're using a nonstick, just go with a fairly inexpensive one that you know will hold up over time. And that's typically why I go to a restaurant supply place because in restaurants, when you're in the kitchen, you're using those pots constantly. And so they hold up really, really well. Um, you know, you can definitely get something at like a big box store or something like that online as well. Um, I just find that the restaurant supply ones work really well too. So um, that's typically, you know, I don't have a brand specific that I go to, um, but I hope that helps with you as well. So Virginia, what are your thoughts on using project products designer taste to look like meat? Uh, it's better to stick to whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and bypass meat-like products. Well, it depends, you know? So, um, you know, like I said, kind of starting out on this, if you're switching to a, a whole food plant-based diet um, and you're having troubles with it, some of those replacements, you know, are great kind of uh, boosters, you know, so you can switch from one to the other. I've had family members um, myself that were, you know, I want to start eating less meat or I want to go vegetarian or vegan. Um, and that was a great place for them to start. You know, they um, might have like a hamburger once a week or something like that. And then if they had a hamburger that was plant-based, they could replace it with that and still keep their traditional you know, meal for the week. Um, now, are they good for you? That really depends. Um, and, it, you know, the best place to find out is the ingredient list. If you look at the ingredient list, you want your ingredients to be pretty short on there. And your great grandmother should pretty much be able to just pronounce every single ingredient on that. Now, if it's not, you're ending up with a lot of chemicals and stuff that, you know, are they really food? It's definitely not a whole food plant-based. So it is always best to do your whole grains, fruits, vegetables um, instead and just bypass the meat uh, altogether. But the other meat-like products, there are some ones that are actually quite good, you know? Uh, so like an example I can think of right now is like a beet poke bowl, right? So poke is usually done with like an ahi tuna or some sort of fish in it, um, but doing the meat replacement, you're basically just taking the beets uh, and marinating them in the same kind of a marinade you would do the fish in. 
Um, so you're still getting that whole food plant-based meat replacer, right? Um, Cause it's just the beets with the marinade. Then you can build the bowl any way you want to. Um, now something like I mentioned earlier, like the Beyond Meat uh, or Impossible Burgers, those have a lot of stuff in them um, and they're made to taste just like meat. Now, someone like myself, who's been, uh, you know, plant-based as long as I have, it's been years and years. So if I eat something and I get a flavor profile of meat, I instantly want to spit it out because I think it's meat. Now, Beyond Burger actually does that to me, or I don't like the flavor of it. Um, that's not, I'm actually not the demographic of the type of person that they built Beyond Burgers for. They're made to taste and replicate meat. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of processing they have to do to be able to make it taste that exact same way. Now, if you're looking for something like a plant-based burger, just look for things that are, um, you know, again, you can pronounce all the ingredients on them and there's not a ton of ingredients on the back of it as well. Um, so I hope that helps, um, you know, uh, designed and taste like meat products typically are a great transitional tool for people, um, you know, but it's not something I would, do really regularly um, in my diet personally, but it's really up to you. I hope that helps, Virginia. So Bob, because many fruits will be out of season shortly, is there a pre-made fruit paste, which is good and nutritious? Thanks. So yeah, there are a lot of them. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I, I always recommend to people this, um, my grandparents helped raise me. So I have a different perspective on food some ways. Um, and one of those is in canning. Um, so canning is actually a really good way to be able to store the fruits that are in season at the moment and be able to utilize them at their full flavor and full nutrients later on in the year. Um, the USDA just put out a new guidebook on canning as well. So if you search USDA canning guidebook, you'll find one as well. Um, I think you might have to, they, they might charge for it. I'm not sure, but I know the 2015 one is still free and widely available as well in a PDF format. Um, that, that actually has a host of different uh, vegan recipes in it as well, too, which I was really pleasantly surprised by. And then you can make all kinds of preserves or you can do the whole fruits, but it's a lot of different ways to be able to do canning on those. So um, I don't have a specific recipe on a fruit paste, um, you know, that I would recommend right away because really depending on uh, what I'm looking for and, um, you know, I use different kinds of fruits and different pastes uh, all the time. But uh, that's probably what, what my best recommendation would be for you is to look into canning. Um, and specifically the USDA canning, you know, has a lot of the fruit paste recipes and they're all free, they're widely available and they're time tested, which is great. So thanks for the question, Bob. Pilar, um, how do you accomplish not using a million dishes and utensils while cooking? Wow, um, that is always a challenge depending on what you're doing in the holiday season, that's always we need a, a, a dishwasher person specifically just is going to do dishes. So I totally understand your struggle on that. Um, so how do you not use a million dishes? Uh, they're, you know, along with the concept of mise en place, everything has its place. Um, you definitely want to do the same thing in your kitchen. So when you are uh, making your mise en place, you're typically using the same cutting board and you can do it out in individual dishes, which looks beautiful and it's great for pictures, but you can also just put it in different sections on a plate or another cutting board. So you have all of your ingredients all separated out. So when you need them, you can actually put them into places. Um, and as far as pots uh, and pans go, it depends uh, on what you're cooking, but you know, a lot of times I'll just do things in one pot or pan if I just don't want to make a huge mess. Um, and some of those involve, like I might do cook off an, like a mushroom and onion first in a pan and then put it off to the side out of the pan and then cook something else in that pan and then put the mushrooms and onions back in, just depending on the texture uh and flavor profiles I'm looking for. Um, but yeah, that is a tough one. And I think everybody still works on that as well too. But just being smart about it, uh, looking at your recipes, wonder if you can get it done in one pot versus two. Um, and then, you know, not getting all the bowls out, just actually putting them on one surface instead, I think is probably the best tip I can give you. But I'm also very guilty of that myself, depending on the event. But the biggest thing is just to clean up between um, you know, dishes or clean up uh, between steps. It's uh, part of just being uh, in the kitchen and cooking is the cleanup is just as important as the cooking as well too. 
So thanks for the question. And uh, if you have any other tips on that, you can definitely tell me too, because I am guilty as well. Um, wonderful. So, so uh hello, Mr. Dan, what's a great way to cook apples for a pre-dessert? Well, there are a host of different ways to be able to do apples. Um, you know, I have a good friend, uh, Randall, who's on our staff here, just uh, came up with a recipe of baked uh, apple roses, which is quite beautiful. Um, and he showed a couple different ways to do them where you can actually just slice them very thin and either microwave them or just do a quick saute or just do a quick bake on them as well. Um, and then you use a puff pastry at the bottom, tuck them in and roll the whole thing up and it makes this beautiful apple rose um, that you can bake off. And it's a, just a wonderful way to be able to do that. Now that's more of like a dessert. Um, so, but for a pre-dessert, uh, you might want to do a poaching as well. So poached uh, fruit is wonderful where you're basically cooking the fruit in another liquid. So you're basically filling up a pot with um, your poaching liquid and uh, it can be all kinds of different things. A lot of people will use wine, um, but fruit juices are actually a, a really good alternative for that as well too. Um, and then put different spices in it and play around with it a little bit. You know, you can do things um, like star anise in there and cinnamon um, and really get that poaching liquid to a really great flavor. And then um, you cook your apple in the liquid um, and you can do it to fork tender. Um, you can do it so it's really, um, you know, I don't want to say soggy. That's typically not the texture you're looking for, but you want a little bit of crisp to it as well, too. So um, a, a lot of different ways to be able to make those happen. Uh, baking them is also another great way to be able to uh, have kind of pre-desserts. I love to make, um, you know, like apple chips and different kinds of, uh, you know, chips where you basically will just slice the fruit very thin and then just do a slight, um, you know, maybe just a little bit of cinnamon over the top of it or your spice uh, that you really like. Um, and then just do a quick uh, bake on them or dehydrate them. Dehydrating is a great way to be able to do those as well too. So thanks for your question there. So if I see you have another one here, what's a great way to cook eggplant for an appetizer? Well, eggplant's definitely one of those fun things to do, um, but you do have to kind of look out for the texture on it because if you overcook it, it can completely go, you know, like limp, which is not great. But that, depending on the recipe, that might be what you're wanting to do. Um, you know, there's a host of different appetizers for eggplant though. You can, um, you know, you can do it in uh, like, like a, uh, I'm trying to think, it's like a Bagdan Bartha, it's like an Indian dish um, that you can do, and it's typically served in a bowl, but you can actually cube it and do it on like sticks as well, which is a fun thing to be able to do that I've done in the past. You can also slice the eggplant um, lengthways, so it's really longer pieces, and make it into a satay as well. So uh, also on a stick, you know, so you basically kind of uh, arching it over, you want to put it into a marinade, and then put it on um, the stick afterward, and then you can bake it off in your oven. It doesn't take too long to do that, um, especially, you know, because you want to keep your texture on it, so you don't want to cook it too long as well. Um, but yeah, there's a host of different ways to be able to do eggplants for that as well, too. But the satay ones on a stick, you know, always fun ways to be able to make that happen. Um, and you can actually even do like an eggplant bacon with those, too, using like uh, liquid smokes and a little bit of soy, um, a little bit of ginger as well, too. So I hope that helps. Terilyn, hi there. Hi, Dan. What are your thoughts on Epicurean cutting boards versus solid wood cutting board? And what's your favorite and what's the best for my knives? I am not sure what an Epicurean cutting board is. Um, but uh, I'll tell you, I typically use solid wood cutting boards. Um, there are certain things I'll use plastic ones for if something's really, really wet. Uh, but because I never have any meat in my house, I don't have to worry about, you know, the plastic versus wood. So I typically use wood. Um, and I honestly think that the wood cutting boards are better for your knife as well, too. Um, so my recommendation definitely would, um, but in the same way with your nonstick pan, you know, it'll start to get chips and stuff in it over a while, depending on how aggressively you're cutting. Um, so it'll be something you'll have to replace eventually as well. Um, and that's the same thing with like a plastic cutting board too. Um, and the plastic cutting boards, you know, I'm trying to think of something that I cook on that, that or I use that for that it's pretty specific, but, um, you know, definitely the wood is my option, but that's just my personal preference. The plastic ones totally work just as well. I think that might be what you're talking about in this. Um, but yeah, so a wood cutting board, 
pretty much all of my cutting boards are like that. And you can also, they're beautiful. You know, it's like nice to have the natural wood on those too. So I hope that helped, Terrilyn. Melanie, can you use a nonstick pan to no oil saute? Uh, if not, why? No, you totally can. Um, you know, we teach in the Ruby class to be able to use the stainless steel pan like that, which is fine, um, and get your water bead in there as well too. But I do no oil sauteing all the time in a nonstick pan. Um, it, it works either way, um, you know, the depending on how good your nonstick is. Um, it can be really easy too, which is nice, but you definitely can do uh, no oil sautés and nonstick pan. I've been doing it for 10 years. Um, you know, it's one of my expertise is no oil cooking. Um, and I've been using, you know, nonstick pans all the time for it. Of course, you can do it on a steel as well as we've shown, but uh, it will totally work on a um, nonstick as well. So thanks for your question, Melanie. Thanks for joining us. Teresa, thank you for coming. Uh, for my Ruby courses, do I actually need a Vitamix high-speed blender or other good options? You don't need a Vitamix for the Ruby courses. Um, you know, the none of the recipes we do in the Ruby courses, except for maybe the macadamia nut cheese, you know, and that's kind of on the border. Um, and I don't think that's a required recipe either. Um, what I, you know, everything else you can use just a regular blender for. And it'll be totally fine. So like a $10 blender would be fine for the majority. I mean, 99% of the stuff that we have in Ruby at all. Now, are there other good options besides a Vitamix? Yeah, there are definitely other options. Um, you know, I think Ninja makes a really good high-speed blender. There are a couple other European ones that I can't think of off the top of my head, but there are a lot of other high-speed blenders out there. So brand-specific, I uh, wouldn't worry about that, uh, but a high-speed blender, you know, again, will help you chop up things that are really coarse, like, uh, you know, the nuts, like cashews or um, the macadamia nut cheese, stuff like that. Those are good things to be able to have those. If you don't have a high-speed blender, you can still do those. You just need to give the blender a break, right? So don't run it until it just shuts off on its own. Run it for a little bit, let the motor cool down, run it for a little bit longer, let the motor cool down. Um, so you can totally use a regular blender for those as well. Um, but to answer your question for Ruby courses, you don't need to own a Vitamix or a high-speed blender for anything in those as well. Hope that helped as well. So Katina, how do you know what to mix together that does not create acidity? I like to make vegetarian dishes and because of my acid reflux, I wanna heal by combining ingredients well so I don't create acidity. Uh, can you make any suggestions of what combos to avoid. So in my experience, a lot of that acidity is going to come from acidic fruits. Um, like other fruits and vegetables do have acids in them, but not a high concentration on something like uh, the fruits or your vinegars. Um, now, there are some combinations you want to avoid because of that too. For example, like uh, pickling, right? So most most quick pickles are all done in vinegars, which is high acid. So pickles would probably be some of those things as far as combinations you'd want to avoid as well. Um, you know, but the other high acids in those fruits, um, some things, you know, people might not think of are like tomatoes actually have a acidic content to them as well too. So, um, you know, just think of the high acid foods and those are probably the ones you want to probably avoid for that as well. But again, I'm not a doctor, I'm a chef. But uh, if you're trying to avoid acidic foods, um, you know, that's probably the best route is to be able to avoid things like lemons, limes, oranges, uh, you know, tomatoes, and then different things like pickled foods, some fermented foods as well, too, um, just to be able to avoid that acidic combination. Um, but that's probably as far as I can go on that as far as a recommendation. So hope that helped. Marie, thanks for joining us today. I get intimidated by vegan recipes. What are your favorite quick meals that one can do during the week? Or where can I find recipes that are good? That's a great question, actually. Um, if you're a member of Ruby, you can actually have access to all the recipes are uh, on, on your page. So if actually, after you're watching this or open up another window, you can go up to the top right on, on Ruby and you'll see there's a recipe index there of all kinds of great recipes to be able to do that uh, our chefs have all um, come up with and they're 
you know, a great way to be able to kind of mix and match. In fact, I look at them quite often now just to be able to get some inspiration um, and look through some other uh, recipes. So that's probably the best place that I would point you to. Um, you know, the Forks Over Knives website has got a ton of recipes on it too if you're one of the people that's taking one of the Forks Over Knives classes. But really, uh, you know, about getting intimidated by vegan recipes, the best thing you can do is practice, right? So the more you're in your kitchen and the more that you're actually, um, you know, doing the recipes over and over, uh, the better you'll get at them and the less intimidated you'll be by them as well. So I think that the, the best recommendation I can give you is find a couple core recipes that you really enjoy. Um, and, you know, you'll get better at those recipes each time you do them. Um, so, you know, look for those flavor profiles that you really like, and then uh, start making those recipes on a weekly rotation. Now, you don't want to pick all recipes that are really hard, right? You want to probably pick ones that are very familiar, maybe for six of the days, and then do the, the last day when you have a little more time to be able to focus, do that one recipe. And then if you're doing that each week, you can add another repertoire and a different recipe in there, um, and then switch it up a little bit to be able to add more recipes to it, and you'll get more familiar with the recipes and less intimidated. One of the biggest things to remember about a lot of the cooking, especially for vegan cooking, is work, uh, techniques. So once you get some of those core techniques down and you start getting used to them, um, they become much, much easier and they almost become like a muscle memory. So just to, um, you know, look for those quick meals, um, you know, just kind of building that library, if you will, of recipes to be able to do during the week. I switch it up all the time. You know, uh, what I'll typically do, and you can, you can uh, look on the archived live events. I've done an event on batch cooking where I take you into my kitchen and show you how I batch cook everything for the week. Um, and that way, when it comes time for dinner, I'm basically done really quickly because it only takes about 15 minutes to be able to cook a meal because I've already done all the prep ahead of time. Um, I think that's a really great way to be able to cook and to make it quick and easy for yourself as well too. Um, but that of course is a little bit more planning ahead. So like when you get home from the grocery store, put everything away in the pantry and everything away in the freezer, but get out a cutting board in your vegetables and start cutting them up into usable size pieces that you use through the week or, you know, marinating your tofus and put on a pot of rice, you know, so you can take those and heat them up really quickly later on in the week as well. So I hope that helps definitely get in that kitchen and uh, keep practicing because you'll feel less intimidated by it. So good luck. Oh, fat. So uh, you have a lot of tahini sauce and cashew butter. What's a good way to use them? Um, wow, that's, there's endless possibilities on those. So uh, first and foremost, I come up with sauces, you know, so tahini sauce is great. It's just a tahini blended up, um, but you can make that with the cashew butter, you can blend the two of them together um, and make a great dressing of sorts too. So, um, you know, you can add just a little bit of acid to that and some other spices uh, and a little bit of liquid and blend that up and you'll have a really nice dipping sauce or, a, you know, a cashew tahini uh, dressing that you can put over salads. Um, you know, tahini is, uh, you know, something that it's really easy to be able to use. I love it in hummus. Um, I put a lot of it in hummus. So you can blend it with the eggplant you talked about earlier and make a baba ganoush. Um, you know, so you basically just roast your eggplant, blend it with the, ta with the tahini. Um, and if you wanted the cashew butter, you could put it in there too. But I'd, I'd typically just use the, um, the eggplant roasted, blend it up with some tahini, a little bit of salt and some lemon juice. And that's a wonderful way to be able to use the eggplant and the tahini or, or the eggplant you were talking about earlier and this tahini. So I hope that helps. Uh, that should create a couple of great dressings for you, or at least a really good uh, eggplant appetizer. All right. So Nadia, thanks for joining us today. As a brand new cook, how can I uh, make being a plant-based chef profitable, but simple, cost-effective, duplicatable, and an entry-level cook for myself? I'm being asked to work at a wellness center to help as a coach. Nice. And I want to cook. Well, you know, to answer that, um, to make it, there's, there's kind of a lot, that, a lot of things in there. So to make it simple and cost effective, um, you know, those are things that just kind of come with experience. The more you do them, um, the more simple it will become. Cost effective, uh, really, it's nice to be plant based because our ingredients are a lot cheaper than meat, which is great. 
But try to use tips like going into bulk sections instead of buying things in packages. So if you're buying things like lentils or beans, buy them dry and then be able to cook them um, instead of doing a canned item as well. So that's a, a way to be able to make it cost effective. As far as profitable goes, there's a whole business lesson in there um, that I don't think we have the time for today. But um, you know, as far as making things profitable on making money as a vegan cook, um, there are a lot of different factors depending on where you live, your business type, um, you know, how the health coaching kind of relates into that. Does the place that you're working at with the wellness center let you charge for things separately? Um, so that's kind of a bigger question than I can answer at this second. But then uh, duplicatable. So how do you do it over and over? The big thing I can recommend for that is writing everything down. Uh, make sure you have your measuring cups, measuring spoons, and everything with you as well. Um, because if you're writing recipes, you want to be able to measure it all out so you can duplicate it later. Um, you get better with this over time, especially with recipes that you're familiar with. But, um, you know, if you're just starting out for this, uh, you, you want to basically write your recipes out and make sure you're using the correct tools to be able to do, uh, make it so other people can actually do the exact same recipe too. Um, and as far as just saving money wise, uh, again, buying from bulk is a, a good option to be able to make that happen um, and buy everything in its whole uh, form. So don't get things like the, I don't know, like the slaws and stuff like that. Those are things you can do really easily and they're super cheap to be able to make um, uh, at home as well. So I hope that helps a little bit. And congrats on the health coach job. That's great. Uh, so Nadia, um, the connection was interrupted with the part you said about to batch cook. Is this in the Forks Over Knives course or where can we find that? That is actually in the archives of these live sessions. So all of these live classes we record and then post them on our live events section on our website. So you can you know, just find it on that or you can go to the YouTube channel and find it through that as well too. So a couple different places to be able to um, find the batch cooking. And Patrick, thank you very much. There's the live event right there. Uh, and that's uh, a great, you know, I had a lot of fun doing that, but a lot of people found it very helpful too, um, to be able to see how we do the batch cooking at our house. All right, so Suad, thanks for coming today. Hello, I am from Algeria and I'm happy to talk with you. I want to know if the school allows studying in Arabic uh, and also knowing the most important sec secrets of cooking. <laughs> I, I can't tell you all the secrets of cooking because they're secrets. I'm joking, of course. Um, the most important secrets of cooking is definitely uh, just having passion about what you're doing. You know, the, the more you work on your cooking skills, and the more passionate you are about it, um, you know, the better cook you're going to become, the more flavorful your food will become as well too. Um, and just getting to know more about food is the best, you know, secret you can have. Uh, uh, so I think that's probably the best uh, way I can explain that one. And um, for studying in Arabic, yeah, of course. Um, you know, we what we do recommend for a lot of our courses is using something like a Google Translate where you can basically take any of the text that you find in a Ruby class, you can copy it and paste it into Google Translate. Um, and you can do the same, uh, you know, the same way back too. So uh, if you want to flip it back into English, you can write out in Arabic, put it into Google Translate and put it into your courses as well too. We do have students that, you know, give us, because uh, I'm also one of the instructors, I see a lot of grading. Um, we do see students writing in Arabic to us, and that's totally fine. That's uh, We just put it in Google Translate ourselves and then write you back in, uh, uh, in Arabic or in English. So that's totally fine. Any language you want to be able to do that in. English is the preferred language for most of our instructors here. Um, but, you know, if, if you uh, just use the Google Translate, I think that's a, probably the best option we can give for you. So happy studying and uh, hope you are successful with the secret of cooking. So Gatina, thanks for joining us. What's an effective way to prepare good recipes for the week? Do most prep in the weekend, freezing some of the ingredients for the week meal. I still find myself chasing meals to do impromptu cooking, creative but time consuming. Yeah, that's so that link that Patrick put up there uh, was up there a little bit ago. Um, is probably go search the live event for batch cooking. Um, that really breaks it down really, really well on uh, prep. You know, so what I do is I typically do my grocery shopping on a Sunday. And when uh, 
you know, on that Sunday I get home, I'll put everything away in the pantry and everything away in the freezer, but then I'll do about an hour or two's worth of work, cutting up all the vegetables that I need for the week, putting them into airtight containers in the fridge and, um, you know, doing things like batch cooking, uh, like beans or rice. And I'll plan out my meals through the whole week. So my wife and I will sit down and we have two little ones. So we have to plan out everybody's meals and we'll go through to figure out exactly what we need for the week and then chop them up. So they're just super easy to be able to pull out and uh, make happen. So that is definitely the best way that I've found to be able to make it happen because then when you're done with work or whatever, and you go into the kitchen, most of the work has already been done for you. All you have to do is take everything out and cook it. It's the same way every meal you've ever gotten at a restaurant takes about 15 minutes or less to be able to get it. It's because they've already done all the prep in front of them is something called a line and they have all the ingredients already chopped up or marinated or whatever. And then they just throw it into the pan to be able to cook. And it takes about 10 minutes to be able to make any of those meals. So that's definitely the best way that I would say to do it. As far as freezing goes, that's great too. Sometimes when I'm making those things, I'll make, you know, maybe I'll do like a vegan mac and cheese bake or something like that. And I'll have one that I'm going to eat that week and I'll freeze another one for later or the, uh, the manicotti recipe that's in the, uh, I think that's in the plant-based pro class. It's another one. That's a great one to be able to freeze where you can make the, uh, the tofu manicotti, which is super, super delicious. And that freezes fantastically. So uh, I'll usually plan ahead. So I'll have one for that week and then one for um, later and I'll keep it in the freezer. So I hope that helps you. Uh, all right, Elmarie, thanks for joining us. How can I continue learning after I finish the plant-based pro course? How can I take my learning to the next level? Um, well, that's a great question. Part of that is just, uh, you know, continuing to to chase the education, right? So it's a it's a wonderful thing. Every instructor that I know at Ruby, all of us are still learning, um, you know, every single day. I've been doing this for over 25 years. Um, you know, so it's definitely something that I'm still learning all the time as well. Uh, and I go to like unconventional sources. Like I said earlier, um, a lot of books I'll get or, um, you know, read are books that actually have meat dishes in them, but I'm actually looking at the techniques or I'm looking on a riff of the same recipe. Like how can I make that dish into something that's plant-based and whole food plant-based? Um, so part of that is just exploring, right? So the plant-based pro course is a wonderful course. Um, and it, covers a lot, but uh, looking outside to other, you know, areas is a wonderful place to go to. Um, cookbooks are a wonderful resource. There are now tons of YouTube blogs and bloggers and stuff like that. They'll come up with just clever ideas for uh, different dishes as well. So, um, you know, just exploring a little bit and uh, having the ambition to be able to go out into the vegan plant-based space, I think is probably the best advice I can give to you. Um, and some of it will work for you, some of it won't. Um, but don't, you know, worry about being in the conventional vegan space as well, too. There's a lot of education you can get outside of the whole food plant-based world um, that you can convert into whole food plant-based cooking. Um, so that's probably the best advice that I can give for you for that one as well. Um, we also have a host of other classes that you can join too. So uh, good luck. Pamela. Hi, Dan. I've noticed that some beans and dolls seem to have some crunchy bits after cooking. Um, it is okay to use a, is it, is it okay to use a pinch of baking soda and the cooking water to soften them up? Uh, does this, doing this have any effect on the nutrients? Thank you. Yeah, you can do this. Um, you know, uh, Usually people over recommend how much baking soda you put into beans to soften them up like that. So if you really want to put just a tiny, tiny pinch in, um, in you typically want to do it kind of earlier in the cooking process. So the water has time to be able to absorb that baking soda as well too. Um, you know, I don't personally use that method at all. Uh, you know, that's the thing about the beans and, you know, lentils that, that each one is very, they're all little individuals, right? So some of them will have different textures. Um, so that's kind of part of that, you know, but uh, yeah, the baking soda, I, I know people that do that as well. Just use very little amount of it um, because a little goes a really long way. If you're starting to get bubbles forming on the top, kind of like you see with like, a, you know, chickpeas or something like that you probably use a little too much as well it doesn't have any effect on the nutrients that i know of um, but i have seen that it does soften them up as well 
All right. So, Bofat, what's the difference in purpose between clarifying butter and normal butter? Uh, being plant-based, uh, not really my expertise on that. Um, so I'm not sure what to tell you on that one. Uh, I know that there's definitely the clarified is a, uh, I, I can't tell you to tell you the truth. I've been plant-based so long, I don't remember that one. Um, so I'll try to I'll write down your name and I'll write you back on that one as well too. Um, all right, Gabriella, how are you doing today? My question is, what kind of bread do you recommend for sandwiches, et cetera? People are intolerant, have IBS in order to reduce digestive systems. Yeah, so I can't really comment on the IBS at all, but the bread that I like to use most often for sandwiches is a company called Dave's Killer Bread. It's by far the closest to a whole food plant-based that I found, but it also has a lot of other things in it that are whole food plant-based, which is great. Um, my kids love it, uh, you know, which is wonderful. Um, and it's, it's uh, they have whole grain versions of it. So uh, that's probably my go-to for uh, sandwich bread. Uh, other breads, I'll typically just bake them myself. But um, Dave's Killer Bread Slices, uh, I, that's probably my top pick for uh, doing sandwiches. Uh, I hope that helps, Gabriella. Uh, Kalawate, sorry, I might be mispronouncing that. Uh, what can we use in the place of aluminum foil? Uh, it depends on your cooking technique, like what you're cooking. A aluminum foil could be covering things, but you could also cook inside the foil. Um, so, or you could use it as a nonstick surface. So I guess I'll cover those three. If it's a nonstick surface, uh, you could just do a little bit of oil on the bottom of a sheet pan, you know. Uh, typically when I do it, if I'm going to use oil, I'll put the oil in the pan and then wipe it down with a paper towel so I'm not using an excess of oil. Um, if you are doing it to cook inside of, like a lot of times I'll do like a potato onion mix inside, inside of, uh, you know, aluminum foil, you could use a pot with a lid would be uh, just fine and totally do the same thing as well too. Um, if you are just to cover it, you could do uh, other things like maybe a parchment paper, um, you know, um, yeah, that's probably where I'd probably go with some of those as well. Um, just things, you know, if you're looking just to cover it as well, there's something with a lid would probably work just as well too. So I hope that helps. I'm not 100% sure um, if that was exactly what you're looking for, but those are the three that came to mind right away. So Pilar, how did you transition to a solely plant-based diet? What motivated you to do so? Being a chef, do you miss eating, for example, scallops or also busco or prawns? So uh, how did I how did I transition? So I'd mentioned this earlier. I, I did it kind of over time. It was a couple months where I eliminated uh, red meat, and then I eliminated uh, like fowl on chickens and stuff like that, and then I eliminated fish and shellfish, and then um, moved on to more you know, centric like uh, gelatins and things like that as well. Um, what motivated me to do so was a book by Tom, or, uh, a book called A Diet for a New America, which is actually written, not, yeah, was it Diet for a New America? That's the title of it, yeah. And it was actually written by the uh, the heir of the Baskin Robbins uh, chain, which is pretty wild. Um, he started looking at health in particular. Um, but that book really inspired me to be become whole food plant-based. And that was a long time ago. It was about 23 years ago. Um, and do I miss eating, for example, scallops or prawns or ascopusco? I don't at all because it's been so long um, that I have not eaten those things uh, that it's not something I really miss at all. Um, scallops wise, I do a mushroom scallop with trumpet mushrooms all the time, you know, uh, but the other two have just not really been you know, not, not something that was really a big on my radar, you know. So uh, as a chef, I wasn't a chef back then. Um, so I used to eat meat products that, that long ago. Uh, but, you know, after getting rid of them, the way I felt without eating those things far outweighed, um, you know, the, the transition of me missing anything for those two. And again, like I said, too, if there's certain things you miss, you can kind of use them with the meat replacers if you want to. There are other you know, the scallops and prawns or other ways to be able to kind of do those in a plant-based world too. So yeah, but uh, being a chef, I don't miss some of those uh, at all um, just because it's been so long. Um, the the kind of crazy thing about that is though too, I've been plant-based for so long, there are a whole host of cooking methods that I don't know about because I don't eat meat. So, 
if you were asking me to like roast a turkey for Thanksgiving, I would have no idea, um, you know, because there's just, just something that's not ever been in my wheelhouse. I've been solely focused on, you know, a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, so it's a, it's a little different like that for a chef, which for my other chef friends are like, how do you do it without that? You know, I'm just used to it because I've been doing it my whole life. Um, hope that helped. Uh, Tara Lynn, Epicurean, oh, is it's a rich light paper composite material. Do you have a wood preference in your cutting boards? And do you ever, and do you do your mise plus? Oops, sorry, that just moved on me. Uh, all right, so uh, Epicurean is a rich light paper composite material. Do you have a wood preference in your cutting boards? And do you do your mise on a board? Have you seen all those mini bowls or do you save them all those mini bowls? So uh, that's great to know what the Epicurean rich light paper is. I still don't know what that is, but uh, I don't have a specific wood preference on my cutting boards. Um, I typically will buy them from artisans, you know, locally from, you know, either crafts fairs or, uh, you know, farmers markets and stuff like that. That's typically where I get them from and just depending on where I am in the country at the time. Um, depending on the woods that they have there. So I don't have a specific one on that as well, too. Um, and do I do my mise en place on a board? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, you know, I have all those little bowls and I use them for photography and taking pictures of things. But in real life, I don't use them for those kinds of things. I do every so often if like I, so like I was cooking something in a pan and I take it out of the pan and put it into a bowl like that. But more often than not, I'm putting it on a cutting board and I section it out like how fast, like when it has to be cooked, you know. So I'll have like my onions and mushrooms on the end and then maybe my ginger and garlic, you know, kind of in the middle. And then some softer things like cabbage or something like that. So I can kind of move them off the cutting board really easily into the pan that I'm cooking in. But thanks for the uh, info on the Epicurean. I did not know that, so I'm glad you informed us of that. All right, so Gregory, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this question relates to guidance around bakes that are that are judged. Shall I assume any deviation of materials, ingredients are not good? I take it I should consider every bake a technical test and perform only against spec requested. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, for um, you know, for doing bakes, typically you do want to use um, the materials that they're doing on those. Like if you're talking about in French pastry school, you want to be pretty exact on those. Um, there, you can always ask the instructor uh, ahead of time too if you want to do a deviation on a recipe um, due to an ingredient allergen or something like that. And we're glad to recommend, uh, you know, changes in those if we have them or if we know that they'll work. We typically don't, um, you know, if we don't know if it's going to work, we're not going to tell you that, um, you know, you should just try it. Um, but typically on a bake, yeah, you do want to use the exact ingredients for those um, because on baking, there's it's a, it's a, an exact science. I've actually never been a great baker myself. Um, you know, in the kitchen, I uh, do the cooking wise and my wife does the baking on it. But my experience as far as, um, you know, any kind of those bakes you'd want to do, you do want to consider it as an exact science because it is a science. So you have different, different reactions that are, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, different reactions that are um, making your outcome perform. So I hope that's right. Um, I would, you know, on any of those bakes, I'd probably use those. So thanks again for joining us, Gregory. Nancy, how do you get keto pizza dough to crisp up? Uh, I don't know what keto pizza dough is. I'm guessing it's probably a, a, a pizza dough that doesn't have any flour in it. Um, and part of that is just, uh, you know, like I, if I, you're doing like a cauliflower crust or something like that, um, you know, I typically would just do like a little bit of a slight oil in the bottom of the pan, um, and then bake it off before I put all the other ingredients onto it a little bit to be able to get it to set. And then I'll put the other ingredients on top of it and bake it off. So I think that's what you're talking about on that one. Not hundred percent sure, but I hope that helped Nancy and Nadia. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yes, they let me charge separately. I have free reign to just add value to the business. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you, this is, you were talking, hi, Nadia. This is your uh, your health coaching. So great. Uh, yes, they let you charge separately. I have a free reign to just add value to the business by offering my own services. And I can add cooking, uh, what I bring to the table there. Or do I do something on the side for myself by making easy, tasty plates? 
Well, you could do either of those things. It's really up to you. I'm not 100% sure of, uh, you know, how it works there for you. But uh, if you are able to bring food and sell it, um, that's great. There are definitely some things like insurance and different you know, things you want to worry about if you're starting a business in the scape as well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things to be able to do with those. Like I know if I'm cooking for something here in Austin and I were to be, you know, bringing it to a health clinic, um, that you'd have to go through health inspections and you'd have to have your kitchen specifically set up uh, as a commercial services, but that's just the state law here and, uh, you know, in Texas. So, be a little bit different depending on where you're at in the country. So um, again, there's a whole lot of detail that goes into opening a vegan based business um, that we just don't have the time to do in a, a live webinar, um, you know, but there are some other resources you can probably check into. And I know that Shar, uh, another of our instructors has done a class on that specifically in the past. So I would definitely check the live events and look for Shar's uh, link on that as well. Her last name is Nolan. Um, and she's done a class specifically on uh, opening up a business, uh, vegan-based business. So I hope that helps. And again, congratulations on that, Nadia. That looks like it brings us to the ends of our questions here. So I'm going to let you off onto your day. So thank you so much for joining us here at Ruby. And we can't wait to see you for our next live event. Have a great day.